Hi, I'm Mark Beardsley, an ecologist and restoration practitioner with Ecometrics, coming to you from the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. I'm here to talk to you about restoring Rocky Mountain beaver wetland riverscapes and to introduce the notion of cultural challenges, the ones we're overcoming and those that may lie ahead. I hope this helps us better understand why something so natural as process-based riverscape restoration often feels like an uphill battle. I'm a beaver believer, and I mean that in the sense that, well, I believe I've stumbled upon a critical aspect of Rocky Mountain riverscape health. But I, well, but I wasn't always a believer. I learned about beavers as quintessential keystone species while studying ecology, and I thought they were pretty neat. But beavers certainly weren't part of my technical training as a river restoration practitioner in the early 2000s. Back then, I learned that rivers naturally form stable channels, sized precisely to a particular bankful discharge, driven by physical processes that balance sediment and flow regime. And they tended to overbank, you know, on average once every couple of years or so. Back then, I learned that restoring rivers meant stabilizing unstable channels. All the practitioners I know in my cohort believe this, whether they were trained as academic geomorphologists engineers, or through training programs like Dave Rosgen's. My work partner Jessica and I came through the Rosgen School. And, and, and there we were taught that the best way to restore rivers was to emulate natural ones rather than designing channels from equations. And boy, that made a lot of, a sen lot of sense to a couple of ecologists like us. But when we learned this, the word natural was always followed by the word stable, as in naturally stable. And the key assumption was that streams inherently form static channels that efficiently transport water and sediment without changing their particular size or shape. We spent years scouring the Colorado Rockies looking for these perfectly dialed stable reference channels to use as blueprints for assessment and design. We surveyed and classified hundreds of reaches in those days. Many of them look just like this one. And we often stumbled on rivers like this. <laughs> well, what do we do with this? It doesn't fit the model, or it doesn't fit the theory of, natural, of a naturally static equilibrium channel form. There isn't even a place for it on the chart. At first, we just wrote these kind of rivers off as anomalies. Like, if we call them wetlands instead of streams, then maybe we can just assume they, you know, they follow a different set of rules. But the more riverscapes like this we found, the more difficult it was to keep ignoring them or keep calling them something else. Cognitive dissonance. That's the uneasy feeling you get when you're trying to maintain belief in two contradictory ideas at the same time. And that defined a big section of my career. <laughs> Trying to reconcile the belief that a natural riverscape like this is somehow unstable or unhealthy because it's dynamic and depositional, well, that was becoming a bit too much for me to bear. As ecologists, we knew that dynamics are important for diversity, and we understood that native keystone species are integral components of the ecosystem, not an impairment. The thing that got me through all this was the science that eventually explained why these riverscapes aren't anomalies at all. Ellen Wall's work, Dorothy Merritt's, Janine Castro, Joe Wheaton, Brian Kluwer and Colin Thorne's 2013 stream evolution model, it was a game changer. To me, this was the beginning of the end of a generation of misdiagnosing the riverscapes I was so familiar with. A new era in riverscape restoration. Yay, science. And we no longer had to look the other way when we stumbled onto a beaver dam or a complex beaver wetland riverscape like this one. In fact, we now study them as natural, healthy standards of stability and function. So yeah, I'm a beaver believer. <laughs> My path to believing came through two decades of careful field observation, a knowledge of history, and the growing body of scientific literature. From that foundation, I can confidently state that this is a healthy stage zero Rocky Mountain Beaver Wetland Riverscape. We can plot it on Nick Weaver's simplified version of the SEM model. 
Adding the pies from Brian and Colin's paper gives us a feel for the high level of hydrological, ecosystem, and habitat benefits that come with a natural beavery riverscape like this. Look, it has vegetation and wood, and beavers use that to make dams and canals. The beaver dams and canals create ponds and wetland, and these support more vegetation and more wood, more habitat for beavers, who create more dams and canals to make more ponds and wetlands for more vegetation and more beavers. Well, you get it. It's a positive feedback loop. Or as I like to call it, it's an ecological engine. On this riverscape, all the parts of that engine are present and working. It's firing on all cylinders. But it didn't always look like that. This picture is the same river just two years prior. Back then it was a single incised channel running through a relatively dry riparian terrace, somewhere in stage one to three. With diminished hydrological attributes and few habitat benefits. Restoring this reach to stage zero would clearly be a huge ecological lift. And thanks to the pioneering scientists you've been hearing from in this workshop, Practitioners like me now have the conceptual tools to understand streams like this. It's not a naturally stable channel. It's a broken beaver wetland riverscape. What parts of this ecological engine are missing? Well, we have good wood and vegetation on this site, but there are no ponds and just a sliver of wetland. There's no beaver dams and most of the beaver canals are dry and there's no beavers. Well, without these parts, this ecological engine shuts down. And without that engine running, we're left with a very different, much impoverished riverscape ecosystem. Or as Janine Castro would say, when the biological engine shuts down, the stream shifted to a simpler state controlled by physics. You can also think of it the way my friend Alexa Whipple, director of the Methow Beaver Project describes it. The biology broke. So the stool tipped over. Wanna stand it up? <laughs> Fix the biology. I wanna pause here to mention the very, that the very fact we're having this workshop with a thousand participants is proof that there's a major change afoot. Process-based riverscape restoration may feel like an uphill battle and trust me, it does often. <laughs> but this workshop alone is such a good sign that we're overcoming cultural obstacles and we're making upward progress. I also wanted to point out that every one of the process-based riverscape restoration examples you hear about in this workshop, well, it was a grassroots effort with a clear champion. One person or a small group that was willing to take on those obstacles, to think outside the box and to go forward with boldness and humility to try something new. You'll see why this is at the end and it's something to keep in mind when we discuss federal land management. Our champion is Ashley Hom, a hydrologist on the Gunnison National Forest who is clearly dealing with the same kind of cognitive dissonance about healthy riverscapes that Jessica and I faced. And she was facing those when she called us in 2019 to ask some simple questions about beavers. Her curiosity, critical thinking, and positive attitude is what made this flagship Colorado project happen. And it couldn't have happened if she wasn't getting support from her bosses in the agency. Well, so here it is, before treatment and after. How did we get from where this riverscape was two years ago to where it is now on the right? Well, we basically did this, a lot of this. <laughs> where the beaver part of the engine was absent, we mimicked it. Where the beaver dams were lacking, we built analogs or BDAs. The BDAs restored, restored old beaver ponds and canals and they re-wet the wetland. And since there's already decent vegetation at the site, we could hope that the restored aquatic habitat would promote and sustain beavers to complete the cycle. Get that engine fired up again. 316 beaver mimicry structures in all over two seasons covering 1.4 miles and 45 acres of riverscape. The left photo shows one segment looking upstream before and after a round of beaver mimicry treatments. The right shows a sequence of BDAs working together on a formerly single channel reach. Here's that segment in August 2021 before any work was done. The stream's flowing, flowing from left to right. 
And here it is in September of that year during the first round of treatments. You can see our team working on a BDA down in the center right of the photo. And here it is the next year in August of 2022 with some beaver activity. And again in September, after more treatments and a little more work by the beavers. Ta-da! <laughs> Stage zero. Okay, one more time. Here's the situation before and our diagnosis. And here after a first round of treatment, some of our best beaver mimicry. And it's always our hope that the mimicry will improve habitat suitability to lure in dispersing kits from neighboring colonies. And this time we got lucky. There's our little partner hard at work. So what do you think? Success? Sure, you can tell we're pretty proud. I mean, by all the traditional ways we typically evaluate river restoration projects with before and after photos and measurements, and some data, there can be no doubt. But this isn't where the story ends. We're actually just getting to the part where it gets interesting. In process-based Riverscape restoration, success isn't defined by simple pre-restoration versus post-restoration channel form, the way we were traditionally taught. It's about the degree to which we reestablish normative rates and magnitudes of the physical, chemical, and biological processes that sustain riverscape ecosystems. At least that's what Beachy said, <laughs> Tim Beachy said in 2010. When we talk about process-based restoration, we absolutely must keep coming back to these core principles. Number one, have we targeted the root causes of degradation? Well, in this case, if the absence of beavers and their works is a primary cause of the degradation, then treatments that mimic, promote, and sustain those do seem to be aimed correctly. Two, since there aren't any significant land use or societal constraints here, the actions we took seem perfectly tailored to the local potential of a stage zero beaver wetland riverscape here. Number three is where some nuance creeps in. When we start to think about the scale of restoration compared to the scale of the problem. And this means we have to be realistic about expected outcomes. I especially wonder about the beavers and the scale of the problem. The extirpation of beavers during the fur trade and colonial expansion was a massive global enterprise. That's not cordwood loaded up on that ship. It's flattened beaver skins. And there were lots and lots of full ships leaving the new world in those days. These boys were on a mission to extract every last beaver pelt from North America. And by all accounts, they did a pretty thorough job of it. By the 1820s, the Rocky Mountain region was considered fully trapped out. Think about that. <laughs> By the 1820s, the Rocky Mountain region was considered fully trapped out of this keystone species. Extirpation of a keystone species? Well, that's a massive anthropogenic disruption. The problem's one of continental scale, but here we are working to restore mile-long reaches. Oh my goodness. Process-based riverscape restoration is about processes, and processes occur over time. So let's expand the time scale of our project reach. When we look back and plot beaver pond area on this reach over the last 70 years, it seems like that activity comes and goes from the site. There's a peak of activity in the 1970s, right about the time John Denver's Rocky Mountain High hit the charts. Then it looks like the local population crashed partially recovered, and then crashed again to zero in 2020. The spike in 2022 is the result of our work. There's good scientific evidence that this boom-bust cycle is an unnatural legacy effect of the fur trade, followed by two centuries of active suppression. Zooming out, we see that the project reach in the con we can see the project reach in the context of a broader 260 square mile watershed. 
And we can plot the level of beaver activity in 2019. The thick lines are reaches with frequent or pervasive beaver activity, and thin lines are sparse activity. And we can compare the existing level of, of beaver activity, where beavers are, with historical capacity, where beavers were. And that gives us a sense of the scale at which these keystone natural processes have been lost. On this map, the historical capacity was estimated using the Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool, or BRAT. Compared to BRAT model predictions, current activity in the watershed is about 1.5% of carrying capacity. Well, that gives me some pause. BRAT's a really simple algorithm that works well in some places and not so well in others. So it's a good idea to be a little skeptical and to follow up with ground truthing. When we do that, a professional assessment of historical capacity using more sophisticated methods and better data, it yielded this result. By this estimate, watershed-wide beaver activity is currently around 16%. That's still pretty grim if you like wetlands and stage zero riverscapes, but it's probably realistic. Current capacity for beaver activity, shown here in dark blue, represents the potential for beavers now. It's basically the same as historical capacity, but we've taken out the reaches that no longer support beaver activity due to current land and water use constraints or degradation from past land uses. Putting, all, putting it all together, we get this. Compared to historical carrying capacity, the current activity levels at about 16%. 15% is either not restorable or would be very difficult or costly to restore due to land use constraints or past damage. And that leaves almost 70% as potential process-based river restoration of beaver wetland riverscapes. Lots of potential. Well, yeah, that's the optimist in me speaking. <laughs> the pessimist is still wondering why beaver populations aren't recovering on their own. Why do the local populations frequently crash? If we, and, and we see this on reaches all over this, the, the Rocky Mountain region, this boom bust cycle. If we redraw our map in the way a population biologist or landscape ecologist might think about this problem as a patch occupancy model, well, it looks like this. Open circles are unoccupied patches and solid ones are occupied. The connecting lines are the rivers and streams, the corridors through which aquatic organisms like beavers tend to move. The pattern shows a depressed population, 16% of carrying capacity. And it's got clustered patches separated by spans of unoccupied and suboptimal habitat, where a beaver would be very vulnerable. Fragmented metapopulations like this often fail to recover due to the simple mathematics of patch vulnerability dispersal barriers, and slow reproduction rates. This may partially explain why beavers haven't recovered, and it may also partially explain how we can help. Scaling up to the watershed, one wise strategy might be to prioritize, prioritize reach scale projects together to create larger and better connected clusters in order to decrease patch vulnerability and increase recolonization frequency. Do you guys see what just happened here? <laughs> we just applied metapopulation biology to a stream restoration project. And of course we should. Biological problems require biological solutions. Applying the principles of process-based riverscape restoration, it forced us to think bigger than the channel, broader than the reach, and across multiple disciplines. So <laughs> to be more explicit about expectations for our reach, number four, well, we can't guarantee that the beavers who moved in are gonna stay and thrived. And based on the historical trends, we have to expect they probably won't. We also can't guarantee the structures we built will last forever. In fact, we explicitly built them so they wouldn't. Therefore, we can't, we can't guarantee that the beautiful stage zero beaver wetland riverscape we see here will be permanent. And I think we have to be okay with that. When the scale of the problem is so much greater than the actions we can take on a reach, we have to accept uncertainty and do our best. 
when our treatments break down and if the local beavers die off, well, there's no shame in coming back to do more mimicry. Process-based restoration is a long game. It's like therapy. It's more like therapy than surgery. And from this perspective, the binary terms success and failure don't really apply. We have to get used to incremental improvements and percentage gains. One big cultural barrier to process-based riverscape, re riverscape restoration is going to be learning how to let go of the expectation of permanence. So I think success is too strong of a word. Let's just say we're happy with the progress. This brings us to the big question about why we do it. Restoration, I mean. Why do we restore healthy riverscapes? While I'm not at all shy to admit that my main motivation is a general respect for life and biodiversity, doing something to help the critters who depend on these habitats. And there's so many of them, as artfully rendered by Tori Ritter's amazing diagram. But I'm not here to push that stuff on you. I know most people have more pragmatic goals. For most of us, it's about what these riverscapes can do for us. The potential for natural infrastructure benefits are attracting a lot of attention to our humble little project. The local conservation district is interested in the potential of riverscapes to capture and retain sediment from wildfires, hoping that they'll um, keep that sediment out of their reservoirs downstream. The U.S. Geological Survey wants to study how restoration affects water retention and groundwater recharge. Our Water Conservation Board wants to know how, these, how this kind of work affects stream flow. The Rocky Mountain Biological Lab and university researchers, they want to study hyperreic flow and biogeochemical cycling related to water quality. And our parks and wildlife folks are interested in the benefits to fish, game, and threatened species. These are all awesome benefits and real practical reasons to restore naturally healthy riverscapes. But the funny thing is, that we didn't, act, we didn't actually design for any of that. Those are just the things that happen when you reestablish natural processes on a riverscape like this. If process-based riverscape restoration sometimes feel like an uphill battle, and I keep telling you it does often, well, I think that's because we're asking practitioners and land managers to think in an entirely new way with a different and expanded skill set. We're not asking them anymore to identify specific purposes, to set a very specific set of objectives, and to, to, to design solutions to those objectives. And building, we're not asking them to build permanent infrastructure. That's the past model, a top-down approach based on controlling nature. Instead, we're asking them to understand ecological health, to diagnose disruptions to the natural processes and to prescribe treatments that nudge them back into place and to keep being stewards of these lands to keep them working. The new model is a bottom-up approach based not on controlling nature, but on supporting it. We're asking people to be stewards rather than masters of our riverscapes. That's a huge philosophical shift but it's an important one, and it's going to take some time, maybe a generation. It's an uphill journey, for sure, with lots of challenges, but we're off to a good start. Thank you.